presenting. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the next episode of the Yes She Can project. I can't tell you how excited I am to have this gorgeous lady with me today. Um, hello, Holly. Hello. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. I am in my daughter's bedroom for those that are um, watching on the visuals. We did have a little false start, didn't we? Because we were in my hot office um, and I had to run in here. So now I have the privilege of staring at my daughter's messy bedroom, which is, it's fine. I'm fine about it, as you can Lock tell. It out. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you for having me on the show, though. Thank you for coming. I really appreciate it. Um, so for anybody who doesn't know you, Holly, would you like to introduce yourself and just tell us a bit about what you do, please? Absolutely. So uh, my background is, it's never a succinct answer, by the way. My background is I was a TV actress for many years. So I started acting when I was 11 years old. I then um, went on to do singing. So I was actually signed to Sony for a while and released a single and did all the singing lark. Um, I'm currently a self-development coach, which means I'm an NLP practitioner, a life coach, just recently a hypnotherapist as well, which all sounds very fancy. And um, I am the founder of the Happy Me Project. And the Happy Me Project is my brand of self-development, where I believe that my job is to help people feel more happy and less crappy. And I really, truly believe that any self-development type work, self-help, life coaching, coaching, all of that stuff. It doesn't have to be a fancy thing. It doesn't have to be a big deal. And I try to keep things as no nonsense and simple as possible. And I do that via online courses, in-person workshops. I do group coaching, a ton of stuff on social media and a podcast as well. And, and a book to come. That's in the offing as well. Oh, that was one of my questions for later. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> well you've heard it here first folks <laughs> exclusive <laughs> yeah <laughs> well there's a lot of talk actually holly i mean i know um life coaching and things like that and um the kind of work that you're doing it's really really prevalent at the moment especially i would say even more so in the last 12 months because a lot of people have really struggled to kind of find who they are once they've had to stop for such a long time. Um, I think there's sometimes a bit of negativity associated with it, like, oh, I don't need a life coach. I can do this, that and the other. But it's so much more than that. And it's it's not just about working with somebody to find out what you want to do or what you should be doing. It's more about working with you to to build somebody's confidence and make them see how incredible they are, really. Absolutely. And I'm such a big advocate. I don't think, I mean, the reason I got into self-development in the first place was because I needed self-development. So growing up on television gave me a lot of stuff to, to navigate, you know, be, being the kid off the telly at a normal school gave me a lot of stuff to navigate. And I, you know, grew up in a time where we didn't have mindset stuff. No, you know, my dad was a welder. My mum worked in a bank. We didn't talk about mindset and meditation that wasn't and, and my parents are very liberal and open-minded and but it wasn't the norm to talk about that stuff and I can't really remember what was the catalyst to me getting involved in doing self-development other than the fact I didn't feel good I felt really like a bit of an alien that I was this kid that you know was going to a normal school but really had this other stuff going on I was always a very deep child um that you know all of those you know full of emotion full of you know what I was always very driven you know I started work at 11 because I wanted to do these I had this bigger picture mapped out for myself and I, I just struggled to find you know how to feel good and so I started to do self-development type stuff and it worked for me and so I always did it as an actress just because the world of acting is, you know, highs and lows, ups and downs and all of that. And so I just did it for myself and I would read all of the stuff, do all the courses, do all the books. And I really only got into it as a business when my husband, so my husband Ross was diagnosed with brain cancer. And that was the catalyst to me kind of taking it as to a new stage of actually being my work. And I'm an entrepreneur by nature. Like I'm a person who just, I'm, you know, very 
proactive in the things that I do and I just impulsively dive in to do things and things have tended to happen quite organically it was a time in my life when I needed to to talk about that type of stuff and those around me needed me to show up and show them that way to kind of lead the way and what how do we navigate this and it just naturally started to happen that it became my work over the last year during pandemic life I have seen an incredible number of people join my online community, whether it be Facebook groups or Instagram, or come and ask for coaching or do courses. I've seen a massive spike in that over the last year. And you're really right in saying it's because we haven't had the distractions and we've had to sit with our thoughts. There's no going out and getting drunk with your mates. There's no distraction of work. There's no not facing the fact that you don't really get on with your partner or the kids wind you up and you need space to yourself and we haven't been able to hide from our own feelings or grief or any of that stuff we've just been stuck with it and we've had to deal with it and so I've seen a lot more and if I'm being honest these are my people I've seen a lot more normal people come to me and say shit like I don't know I don't know how to do this. Like, what do I do? And and I, I use the word life coach now and again, purely because it's something people understand. I mean, I tend to say I'm a self-development coach. I don't particularly like the, the term life coach because of the connotations that you said and that it implies that I'm going to bool in and go, this is how you should run your life. And, and absolutely, that's not the job of me as a coach. I don't know how you want to live your life. My job is to go, how can I help you How can I ask you the right questions? How can I give you the right tools to know how you can show up for yourself? And that's the key to life coaching. And, you know, and I've had plenty of coaching in my time and still do. And it evolves and it changes. And it really is. If you are a person that has never experienced coaching or done any of this kind of work that we talk about, any kind of self-development type work, it will change your life for the better. And, and just as another caveat, I also don't believe in toxic positivity. And this is often where people get mixed up with the world of self-development in that they'll see a lot of stuff online. And a lot of the stuff you'll see online will be very fluffy. And it will be very like, just don't, just be positive. Just smile. Just be positive. Just I'm cured. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, that's just never been a thing. Like that doesn't, whereas the Happy Me Project, as much as it has happy in the title, my beliefs are not that you have to be happy all the time. In fact, being sad has its place. Being angry has its place. We need to feel all of the emotions. And I think that's where people get stuck because they see a lot of, you know, memes online of this, what what is, so toxic positivity is this, you know, this feeling that you should just smile through your pain, that you just, you put on the, you put on the, the, the front and you just be positive and that will get you through. And we, we know logically that doesn't work. So if that's what you believe that coaching is, of course, you're going to go, that's a load of bollocks. But I hope that with the, you know, the type of work that I'm doing, I will, I'm able to get past that and largely that's down to me just leaning into being myself and being a bit too sweary and a bit you know real and a normal human being and because I share a lot of my own vulnerabilities and my own fears and mistakes I think that allows people to go oh it's okay then it's okay that I can't do that it's okay that actually I'm shitting myself that I've got to go back out into the world now and it's okay because do you know what that person that I follow online Holly seems that confident and stuff but also she admits also that she messes up all the time and so I you know that's kind of that's what I hope to do with the work that I'm doing definitely and I think it's so dangerous for people to have that perception of feeling like they have to hide things because actually all that's going to do is just make them worse in the long run and they're going to compound their lack of confidence because they're going to feel shit and like a failure if they're not able to do that when like you say it's not a natural thing to do anyway no we're allowed no I I jokingly I always say it in the same way because I I joke you know I joke about it but some days you're just gonna watch Netflix and sit in your pants like that that is what's going to happen and that isn't that shouldn't be filled with shame because those days your best work might come out a few days after that you sometimes you've got to break yourself down you've got to allow yourself to have those moments or those weeks or, or you know those years you know maybe 2020 for some people was the year of transition I've seen it for so many people that I've been working with that they've just went this isn't the relationship for me this isn't the job for me 
Um, I love being at home or I hate being at home, whatever's going on for them. But it maybe, you know, the whole year has just shook everybody up and made them reassess. I mean, I know that I have and I think I'm doing the work. But at every stage of my life, I'm still discovering new things about myself, my own coping strategies. And that's the beautiful thing about self-development. It's not about going, I certainly don't believe that you are broken and need to be fixed all the time. But we are all evolving all of the time. So at each new stage of your life, you know, I'm not the same person I was at 16, 17, 20 Uh, even I'm not the same person because we adapt and we change and so trying to deal with life with the same level as you did when you were 21 that ain't going to help you you got to (laughs) grow it's fine it's like that's not gonna that's not gonna cut it is it really because we've all gone through some stuff so you know certainly that's what I love about and I'm I'm so passionate about what I do and it's interesting I sat with a marketing team last year and we talked about you know what why do I do what I do? That's the first questions in business, right? Why do you do what you do? And that was another one of my questions. Marketing could be already asked. So yeah, why do I do it? And do you know what? The the answer for me, if I'm if I really think about it, is that it's not enough for me just to be happy. It's not enough for it just to be me. And that for whatever reason in my psyche, you know, I'm a I am a helper in my 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 core. I'm a person that wants others around me to be on that journey too. And so for me to be on this this journey in life and going through stuff and navigating it and you know trying to reframe and bounce back all of the things that we do, it's not enough for me to get it right and feel good if everybody around me is chaotic and feels bad. And whether that's a selfless thing, I don't know, because maybe it's not, maybe it's selfish. My world doesn't feel good if everybody's sad and depressed around me either. So maybe that's, I don't know. I don't know if we ever do anything completely selflessly, but for me, it is knowing that I can unlock something for somebody. When I work with clients, when I see people online or people come to my workshops or events and, and they say to me, I changed my life after I work with you. That is like, there's no dopamine hit like that. Like, there's no high like that than being that's able to what, that's somebody. what's in you in your core and that's that's essentially what what your why is and what you're supposed to do so every time you get that kind of feedback then you then it's it's almost it's, it sounds bizarre but if you look at it from a flip side all the people that you coach and work with are helping you just as much as you're helping them because you're growing every time aren't you you're getting joy out of seeing <laughs> And I don't doubt that the reason I went into this work as a business in a time of my most difficult time was because actually I get a helper high is scientifically proven that that is a thing like a helper high. And I have no doubt that I get that. Um, I just love being able to see that in people. I really, truly believe in people. And there's a quote, uh, a saying, hang on, I'm going to get it wrong because I'm going to butcher it. But it is. It's an Albert Einstein quote, and it is about. Oh, it's about a fish. I've forgotten it now. <laughs> Hang on, it's going to Google it. Me. But it's essentially, if you, if, oh, I'm going to have to Google it. It's going to annoy me now. But essentially, what you know, I really believe that everybody has their thing. Everybody has a superpower. Everybody has something that's brilliant about them, and a lot of people don't see that in themselves. And so, my job is to shine the light on that, and I love being able to do that and make people recognize, like, you're amazing. I don't care what you think you, you know, all the shame that we carry around with us because we know all the weird shit that we do and all the breakdowns we've had and the mess that we've been hiding that we don't put on Instagram. Like, I don't care about any of that stuff. Like, when I work with people, I know that they're brilliant. I know that, I know that the people that are listening to this are brilliant, even if they can't see that. And so my job as a coach and what I love about it is just being able to shine the light on that and just get, ask the questions get them to see it because it matters and I just believe we're here you know whatever people believe about an afterlife whether you do or you don't is kind of irrelevant because your time on this one if you believe in other stuff that's down to you but your time on this one is like this short it's so short so I just don't want people to waste it and strange enough it's just sparked memory in me there but I was talking to a friend of mine that I was on biker grove with as a kid so on the kids tv show 
and we were talking about, you know, we've known each other a long time, and we were talking about some of the problematic, problematic nature of being a, a child star or whatever, and the stuff that went on in those days with you know, without all of the things that they put in place now for safety. And um, we were talking about all of the stuff, and and I kind of touched on, you know, how I've got to this point because it comes up a lot for me. You know, you were an actress, and now you're not doing that. Like, how did you get here? And I was saying, you know, I think I was always into self-development. And she said, Holly, I remember you doing it like you do now. But when we were kids, you used to do it to people on set and you would talk to people about stuff. And she said, you would always say, this is not a dress rehearsal. You don't get another shot at this. You've got to live this. And I was like, that's so interesting because I don't remember... I can't remember that far back. I'm old. Um, <laughs> and it was interesting for somebody else to say, no, you always did it. You were always that, you know, I was always the weird kid. I was, I was a weird child. Yeah, but you impacted her in such a way that she can remember it all those years later. Yeah. Which so you were really coaching even from 11. That's pretty cool. I was, I was a closet meditator and I was a closet, <laughs> like, I really genuinely was. I mean, oh, I was sorry, it's me laughing. <laughs> No, I, I really was like it's not even a joke like I really actually used to like go home and meditate and then go and kick about on the streets with my friends drinking cheap wine and and listening to happy hardcore dance music and then going home and being like a like a basically a witch just like burning my negative thoughts and stuff um so yeah it was always there I don't know where it started but it was always there but, you know, actually, on what you said about being a child actress, would you say that, um, especially nowadays with obviously everyone that's on TV, then they've got like an instant outlet. People have got an instant outlet to bring negativity, like literally straight into your hand almost. Um, how much negativity, if any, how many negative um, experiences did you have when you were a child actress? So I think you're right The you know, the reach, it didn't reach me in the same way. I got a lot of negativity as a kid at school. Although I was classed as the uh, popular kid at school, I was in that popular group. I didn't spend a lot of time at school because I was filming and then I would go back to school and that was difficult. And there would be a lot of comments about, oh, she's got loads of money or like, you know, I went to a normal school and as it goes, I didn't have access to that money, but I felt the heaviness of that. And, you know, there was a lot of comments from adults, from teachers, from children. It was not, you know, it was, all, there was comments all the time. And so it was quite negative, but it wasn't the reach that, you know, with social media now when I, interestingly, my oldest daughter wants to be, well, she, she wants to be a triple threat, apparently. But I could have to sing <laughs> She will say she wants to be triple threat. And she was saying to me recently, she was arguing the point, I'm sure parents out there will know this argument, in that she wants her TikTok account not to be private. And I've said, not a hope in hell's chance. Don't even, don't even test me on it. And so we were having this argument in the car the other day. And I'm what I do, what I did was I pulled the car up to some bloke on the street um, and just went, go on then, out you pop. Go and do a dance for that man and she was like no i'm not getting out what are you talking about i was like no, no no that's well well you know just go and do a dance for the man because that's what you want to do essentially you want to go and do a tiktok dance and she was like no i don't i was like well we don't know that he's not going to watch so don't test me on it and don't try me on it and her argument was that i was on telly as a kid so her argument was well you were on tv mom so how can you argue that and i said hang on a minute let me just talk to you about how that man, not blaming this poor man on the street, but <laughs> oh, how a bless man is that there being attacked? Yeah. Yeah. Colin off the street and just like, <laughs> at least it's not Dave. <laughs> yeah, not Dave, Dave or Colin. I don't know who it was. And so I said to her, listen, how do you think that that person would get to me? What would happen in the early 2000s and the 90s was that man would have to write a letter. And he would have to go to the post office and post that letter with the cameras in the post office. So he would be, try, you know, would be known who the person was. He would send that to the casting department of the TV show that I who would look at that weird letter from a man and would go, she's not going to see that. And I would have, and I didn't know. And for years, it was actually a guy who did do that, wrote to me every day for years. 
and I had no clue. This is a fully grown man. In fact, I found out once I was over, I think I was 17, 18 at the end of filming Biker Grove and they told me about it. They used to write every day, knew everything about me, like, you know, from what you could see. I mean, you knew a lot of stuff. There was a lot of weirdos on a kid's TV show. Like people were strange as you can imagine. And he stopped writing after he sent me a letter that said he was getting married. Did I want to come to the wedding? And I assume his wife found out and the letters stopped. But that, I mean, my point being, those days, I wasn't really impacted by that. I didn't see it until I signed to Sony. And when I signed to Sony, it was like, I mean, when was that then? 2004, maybe? Two, no, maybe later than that, 2006. I don't know, whenever it was. I signed to Sony. I released a single. And it was just at the time when, I don't even think social media was out, but people were starting to make their own little websites and things. People were starting to be a little kind of normal people knew about a little bit of stuff and a website sprung up that had stolen websites off the sorry stolen pictures off the sony website of me and they'd made this really basic website i mean it'd be hilarious now but it said it had a, a like a what's the word i'm looking for a space for you to write you know who you are what your email is and your comments and in that it said would you spit on holly if she was on fire was the question and then people would be writing underneath it and it was clearly set up by somebody from my school and and at the time my manager at sony was like it's brilliant like it's what you want like you want haters i mean i don't think we called them haters then because we just didn't and it was interesting um that that was the first time i really experienced it it scares me now for younger people and i feel you know i'm i'm a strange breed in that i've i understand Thought that younger generation because I grew up on a platform whereas everybody has a platform now everybody has a social media account and a platform of some kind and you know so I have a different perspective to perhaps other mums of my age when it comes to this stuff and I have seen the negative impact of it you know my my beautiful friend Sophie who um was on Love Island and some of your listeners will know Sophie's story in that she committed suicide now, I'm not saying that that was directly because of comments on social media. There are, it's, you know, suicide is a, a nuanced thing, but there was a hell of a lot, a hell of a lot of hatred and unkind words on her, on her social media. And that terrifies me. Like, it terrifies me the destruction that we can create um, for other people in that space. And so I'm extremely lucky my levels of fame for what want of a better word have peaked in trough and um oh i've just lost you there hang on everybody. You're so my, my levels of, my levels of in case we didn't hear but my levels of fame have peaked in trough and that has been better for me in many ways because i've been able to see the silliness of it you know i've had some incredible highs i've done some incredible stuff whether that be mtv or l magazine you know i don't know lorraine kevin some great stuff and and some fantastic experiences but it's never been the dis or at this point hasn't been the dizzy and heights that's unmanageable and actually what that's done is prepared me for a time when we'll get there because i know where my journey is going with stuff that i'm doing and i know that i will have a tv show within self-development i know what i'm doing with stuff but I feel it's happening. I put it out in the universe. It's happening. I don't know how I'm working it out yet, but it'll happen. And I know that that fame will probably, will, will come again, but I'm also prepared for that because it's, I've had those peaks and troughs and an understanding of my worth isn't to do with who follows me online. Me as a person, you know, the likes that I get, the comments, that isn't who I am as a person. And I think, being in the acting industry has helped me understand the difference between me as a business, as a product, as a, you know, as the, the, the person you see online and me as Holly, as a mom, as a friend, all of those things. And I, I think, unfortunately, a lot of people, when they put their stuff out online, whether that's a business or whatever else, they, they intertwine the two. And so when somebody goes, your business is shit, I hate what you do. They, I mean, not that many people are shouting, but they might, uh, and you're ugly and whatever. Like when people say that, it hits so hard because they've just intertwined everything that they are in that. And, you, and it's not separate. 
and then you've not worked on the two separately and that's what your coaching is all about is to to be accepting of who you are to recognize your strengths and to almost not so much a barrier but to almost be strong enough in yourself so that stuff like that is like water off a duck's back absolutely you just have to think to yourself my little phrase for it is hmm that's interesting so if somebody says something that's like really horrible to you for like an un or unwarranted comments about something that you do you just have to have in your mind hmm that's interesting because it isn't about you it's not about you. It, why? If somebody gives you unsolicited advice or comments, that's about them. Like yeah. that's what. Totally. That's about them. Like that is. Um. So I think it's really important that we just become aware that if we just say to ourselves, hmm, "That's interesting," we can get through a lot of stuff. Yeah, and then we can reflect it and actually sit down and think. Well, actually, what is this person going through that they feel the need to say that? And then you almost have sympathy for them. I know it's bound to be hard, Joe, if you've got like, you know, so many people having a go at you, or if if you've got quite a big public profile. I can't imagine how difficult that is, no matter how secure you are inside. But I think you have to then put boundaries in place. I have some quite high profile clients and we make sure that they're not always running their social media accounts at all because that there's no, even with my, my quote of, mm, that's interesting. If you're, if you're, mm, that's interesting in every few comments, that's a lot to, for anybody to deal with. And unfortunately our brains naturally are inclined to to take on board the negative much easier. So it just means you've got to work harder. So I think once your businesses or your, your work gets to a level where you're really, really high profile, I think it's beneficial to just have some time off your social media and have somebody else take some of that flack for you and just remove that doesn't need to be seen. You know, we're, we're human beings at the end of the day. If we're talking about um, style, for example, I'm tacky as hell. Oh, I like <laughs> the print and black stuff. I like glitter, spray me with glitter and put, I've got a pink front door. I'm not, that's I know good. that's brilliant. I think so. But some people would think that's hideous and disgusting, right? And that's also okay because we can dislike things and I can actively say, right, I love your glasses, by the way, but let's say I didn't and I went, I just, I, and I thought to myself, I wouldn't say it, but let's say I thought I don't like your glasses. Let's say that was the thought in my head. It's okay that that's the that would be my opinion it's okay if I love it. like it doesn't matter that we have a difference of opinion on anything and I think the dip so the difference for me is that I've really learned that when somebody comes to me unless I've actually done something wrong where I can go I oh, know I was out of order that wasn't worded right um then and then I would correct myself unless I have I, I don't have to explain myself. It's okay that we don't. I get an infamy because it was seemingly a political um, video that she made about, essentially it was her saying that homelessness was a bad thing. <laughs> that was it. It wasn't really political. It was like obvious. But anyway, it went viral. And I had a lot of people coming in for me and saying, um, you know, calling my daughter names, calling me names, telling me I was a horrible parent. It was another level. This was another level because... Different for me, as a parent, you know, I mean, I can feel, I can see and feel your body language change because you know you'd go in and I had to stop myself. It's I, I'd, I'd be, I'd just be smashing it everywhere up to get to him. Yeah. I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't have it, no decorum. <laughs> I wouldn't think that's interesting. <laughs> well, it, was kind of thought it was, you know, I had a lot of people that were doing that for me, which was hilarious. And I had to, the, the way I dealt with it actually was going onto their po profiles the people that will comment in and largely when you go on there I would look at their profiles and go this is in our beds and this is not somebody that I would ever listen to their opinion on anything else and that doesn't mean that I don't want to be petty dickhead because of course I do because I'm a, I'm a mom who cares about my daughter and if you go in for anybody that I love I'm you know I meditate for a reason okay <laughs> yeah to keep it all at bay <laughs> yeah. I'm I'm fiery and um but i one of the interesting things with that whole scenario was a guy came on my youtube and he was during that time my husband was having his second brain surgery so it was a really heightened time for us as a family so i didn't have time for any drama either and it was on my youtube channel that that was happening so this guy's sending comments saying boohoo your husband's got brain cancer bring out the tiny violins yeah 
Now, we can both look at that and go, you want to go in, that's your natural reaction on somebody. But then you take a step back and you go, what the hell is going on with you that you think that is an acceptable thing to post to another human being? You must be so traumatized in some way. There's something going on for you. That is not normal. Now, I deal with a lot of stuff with humor. So I deal with it by being a piss take. That's my British sense of humor. And so I was I was going in like back and forth and, and I was being a bit petty because I was having little digs. But I was kind of saying, like, are you all right? Like, do you need somebody need to call somebody? Like, And I essentially started to coach him a little bit on YouTube, just on the comments. And he kind of came back and said, actually, you're quite smart, aren't you? along those lines then he emailed me a really long email explaining his stance and saying that he had had a really bad time with his health over the last year and he had used trolling people online as a way to let off steam that's genuinely what he said and he was a policeman in northern ireland and he asked if i would coach him i know a turnaround i mean (laughs) i know it's like a journey and i was I'm not that big a person. Like I, I couldn't coach that person. No. But oh, I'm so I, glad you said that because had you have said I coached him, I'd be like, how? How could you do that? I couldn't have, I couldn't have done it in an impartial way. Like I will only ever coach somebody if I know I don't have like a conflicting thing there with them. I, I couldn't have done it in the right way because it had been petty. But I don't wish ill on that person because that person's got something going on that's really there's some you know and you have to be especially in the work that I do I have to be so mindful of that with people you know just this week I've had um some dealings with the police um a guy who's been sending me messages for the last 18 months and he's just been locked up in a secure unit and that was an important step um because he was he's a very ill man and as much as I don't, I can hear a child shouting. I can. Um, as, um, as much as I, um, you know, I'm very protective of myself and my family, and that comes first, which is why the police were involved. I also, you know, I care about people. I do, I give a shit. I really do give a shit about people. And whatever the reason for that is, I don't want that person or the guy that's sending me horrible messages online. I, I don't, I don't want people to feel sad for whatever the reason is. It's, and when people post stuff like that, it's just so rarely about the person that they're posting about. It's about them and what they have going on. And if you are a person listening who sees somebody's post online and thinks, I'm going to write a shitty comment. I'm going to tell them they look fat. I'm going to tell them I hated the TV show they were in. I promise you now, no matter how famous that person is, unless somebody's completely running their social media account, they're reading it. They're reading it. My friends, a lot of my friends are famous or have a big following. They read those comments. It hurts their feelings. Like it's not, you think, oh, they, they've got so many good comments. They won't see me. They will. I remember, so, you know, Sophie, who I mentioned on, who was on Love Island, like Sophie would scroll through them. She would scroll through those and look for those and look for the ne- negative comments because when you feel any such way, any sadness about your own self, you're looking for validation that you're right, even if it's negative. And so when you go through like a hundred odd comments, you could have a hundred nice ones, but you would read the negative ones and believe it. It's, it's just so sad. It really is so sad. Do you, do you think like in hindsight, do you think that at the time with what you were going through, do you think, that it was a good idea to answer him on the YouTube thing? That's an interesting question. I think, um, so I have over the years spoken very openly about the stuff in my life. Um, When my husband was in hospice, I was YouTubing. I was talking about it. I talked online. I've, you know, allowed many charities to use my platform to talk about the, you know, this, my life and, and all of that stuff. And I certainly know that from an outside looking in, if you haven't had the life experience that I've had, that would seem really bizarre. And I understand the judgment of some people around that, you know, it, it must have seemed very strange for many people that I was vlogging by my husband's bedside when he was dying. That must have seemed really weird. And what, well, for me, yeah. Videos. Yeah, you're creating memories. For me, I was trying to make sense of it. And I'm, I'm a talk, you know, you can say I'm a talky person, I'm a thinky person. And I grew up on TV with a camera in my face and, and that camera and that place was my 
safe space. Being on set, going to a normal school, all the chaos outside of it. When I was on set, I was in my zone of genius. I felt good. I felt like I was where I was supposed to be and I felt safe. And so it doesn't, you know, it doesn't take a psychologist to work out that for me, being in front of a camera is still a safe place. And so when I'm going, it's comfortable. So when I'm going through my difficult stuff, I talk it out. I, I, what is the word? Like I, I navigate stuff that's going on in here outside of my head. Now there are many reasons for that. I have ADHD as well, which I think we tend to be impulsive in our way of dealing with things. And so I just speak it out. And so I've tended to deal with, I mean, I've got better at working out what is what I keep private and what is mine. I've got better at doing that because of things like when my daughter's video went viral, that certainly opened up a whole can of worms that was, you cannot put the level, back in the box. Isn't it? Yeah. And, it was, you know, it, and I think that taught me a lesson of keeping this, you know, protective, protective space. But yeah, I think when, I've learned since that because I think you're probably right in many ways, having that drama around the time of my husband's second brain surgery wasn't helpful. I was particularly protective and, and I, I think there was probably an element of distraction in it at the time. I, I think looking back on it, however, since that, since my husband's death, I've been so ruthlessly protective of my space that I know that I notice if I start getting into online disagreements with people, this is, I'm obviously feeling there's something going on for me. So a while back, and, and I got taught a lesson again, not long ago, last year, COVID times, my daughter wasn't sleeping very well. It was all difficult, all challenging, you know, as everybody was going through stuff. And I was having to sit on the floor for a while. And so I was Big going bear. on Twitter. <laughs> the floor parents have all been there sat on the floor doing the creeping out of the bedroom and yeah, so I'm getting a bit closer towards the door yeah, working out where the creeks are in your house yeah. we all, we all know all the and, and then they wake up and then you're like a scared spider oh, and just yeah. Yeah, don't. like spider-man trying to get out while I'm the, the skirt and boards and stuff and so I'm sat there and I was I was I was getting on Twitter and, and it was all like political or COVID stuff whatever and, so, and I started getting into it wasn't even a necessarily a political thing it was Russell Brand had said something and everyone was just being so triggered about stuff everybody was being so easily offended and you know I don't want to get onto this bandwagon that you're allowed to be offended but just like my husband used to say when he was alive he would say you've allowed yourself to be offended though you allowed it it's not it's not down to me whether I'm not trying to necessarily offend you like you've allowed that to be something that offends you like we have personal responsibility so I find it highly annoying when everybody's super easily offended by things why are you letting yourself get offended by that why is it your business and so there was something on Russell Brand and, and I can't even remember what it was I didn't think, feel like I was I kind of said what I've just said there like what the fuck he's a comedian it's a comedian why are you getting all offended and, taking- <laughs> and I'm sat there and you know I've been dead careful of not being that person online who argues with strangers but I was obviously tired a bit an- you know anxious bored all of the things that come up for us and so I'm like blah, 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 blah. well the next day I get a notification because I have a google alert on my name and it was <laughs> Yeah, because you know, you press for press stuff that comes up. So if, if I know that I've been in the press and it, um, it Google alerted me that I was in the Metro newspaper and the Chronicle newspaper was a local newspaper at Newcastle and I think the Coventry Telegraph where I live. Um, basically, actress sticks up for Russell Brand at, and then like my sweary tweets. Um, yeah, <laughs> I mean, it was quite hilarious. And actually, interestingly enough, I was at the time teaching... a. Uh, a course on um, getting your business seen and making sure that <laughs> this is how you do it. <laughs> Not in the best way, but that's how it happened. But what I was kind of pointing out was it when something goes out on the internet, it's um, it's out there. And so, yeah. yeah, going back to your initial question, is that a good thing? No, it's not always. And I'm much more protective now in that I don't watch the news. I rarely know what's going on. The only time I ever know what the news is, is somebody else will tell me what's supposed to be going on or what the rules are now. And I do BBC radio every Monday. They get me on to do a motivational chat. And I'm always on just the news is usually on as I'm coming on to the show. So I hear bits of it on there, but I'm 
really protective and I know that I am naturally a fiery person so getting into arguments with people online is just not a good space for my head so no is it probably wasn't so I, I think I was just in the mood for a fight to be honest a lot was going on in my world and I just wanted to I probably did you know looking back on that you know that's five six I don't know how many years ago six years ago now I I probably was just looking for a scrap we know we, we know when we're in a bad space ourselves, you know, just like that guy in Northern Ireland, that's probably what he was doing too. Yeah. See, it's hard, isn't it? Because you want to be all like sympathetic, but then you think, well, actually, you're slagging off my family. Um, or I, it, it'd be really, it, but it's so hard to find a balance. And it's like, you don't want them to get away with it because like you've got your mother bear inside you, especially when it comes to your kids and, you know, your family. But then you think to yourself, but do I want to create an argument with an unreasonable person? Because it's not going to get anywhere. And that's what I've learned that with age. That has definitely come with age. However, it doesn't mean I let people get like get away with things because in my world, I often get we often get taught, you know, just block the person, just you know, do it. And I'm like, nah. <laughs> like not letting I'm, them win. <laughs> like I will school people and I don't know whether because I have done that in the public before um I don't know whether that scares people doing it a little bit because I don't get it a lot I don't, I don't know if just my demeanor kind of makes people kind of think oh shit she might call me out because I, <laughs> yeah. I would I don't know not. whether that's, that's... <laughs> not. I would rather not but I will um, and I but I don't really get it a massive amount you know I um, and, and because I deal a lot of the time people follow me because they're going through some stuff, um, they get a lot of leeway with me because of that. Like I do tend to have a, I just, you've got to learn to know which arguments to attend. Some are important and on the important ones, I will unleash all manner of fury on you, but all manner of holly. <laughs> yeah, all manner. You will not like it. Uh, but for the majority of the time, it's not worth it, is it? It's just not worth the, the disagreement. And again, I go back to it. Other people's opinions of me is none of my business. Other people's that, opinion of you is none of your business. That shows so much strength on your part. I don't think you realise like how you've been able to navigate if someone's saying something horrible about you or if it's like it comes so much from within and it just shows how much self... Sorry. Sorry to stop you. I, my daughter's just had a nosebleed, so she's coming oh, no. hand. I'm just broke. Are you all right? She's fine. She's okay. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Just keep that in the podcast, you know. Just yeah, why not? <laughs> yeah, why not? Um, yeah, she's fine. She's fine. But no, you're you're right, and it 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 takes it has it comes with all the work that I do. I you know it, it hasn't it hasn't come naturally, and you know I don't always get it right. I don't always is you know I don't always do things in the best way it's not that you know and I, and I certainly when I talk about self-development and all that stuff I I want people to know that it's okay when you don't get it right or when you say the wrong thing you can you can police yourself you know you can look back and you can go if I look back on my life there are plenty of things that I've done both in my personal life and in the public eye where I haven't got it right oh I've changed my opinion on it and I wouldn't do it that way now and I think that's important that we all know that that's okay it doesn't mean you have to carry that like guilt or shame on your shoulder I did that thing once and I don't believe it doesn't matter you evolve you know don't don't um, be scared to say that as well don't be scared to say I messed up it's okay to say that too yeah so they say don't they that no failure or no, no mistake is a failure it's it's a lesson but I think we punish ourselves so much don't we over things that we wish that we hadn't done or things that we wish that we had done um but this is what I think is so incredible about the Happy Me Project and all of the work that you do is that you tell it like it is you're so real with it you you don't just you're not fluffy like we were talking about earlier you're not just like oh come and work with me and this this and this and I've learned this I've learned that it's it's actually no matter how much self-development you do still allow yourself to be a human still allow yourself the emotions because I, I read I, I think it was on your website or in one of your Instagram posts and you said uh, no it was in an email actually because mm -hmm. honestly sign up to your emails they're bloody fantastic make you feel <laughs> great that Friday email is great honestly um, and it said that don't 
along the lines of don't punish yourself for if you feel like you have to cry, for example, take that time, allocate that time. And just once it's done, it's done. Forget about it. Go and do something else. Go and find your joy. I'm sure that I'm sure that's what it's like. Go and find your joy. Even if you need to bring a friend, go and moan to them, but then make sure you tell them to stop you after a certain amount of time. Like a, it's like a, a morning allowance, just like an allowance of like, I feel so, I want to feel sorry for myself today and I'm going to feel sorry for myself for a time and I'm going to be pissed off. I'm going to mourn. I'm going to cry. I'm going to eat a tub of ice cream and I'm going to do all of that stuff, but it's not untapped. Are you okay? Sorry, she's just come in all like nose bleeding. Are you okay? I'm recording here. So I don't think you want to come and go and get a tissue, darling. You do. It looks terrifying. Hi. I'm sorry. Here she is. Hi, darling. Oh, get a tissue, sweetheart. I'll text. Get her a tissue. Yeah, go and get her a little tissue. It's probably poked yourself up the nose earlier. Huh? We've had COVID tests today. I bet she's poked. Oh, what a shame. Right, oh, so yeah. You okay? Well, wash your face. You okay? Yeah. Shut the door for me, pal. Just a little bit. Oh. God bless her. Um, I forgot what we were talking about. Yeah, so we were saying about the, um, so yeah, with the email. So yeah, it's um, it's really important that we feel like we we go through that. We can't, you know, what we call emotionally, you know, spiritually bypass stuff. We can't, because otherwise we end up playing, you know, whack-a-mole with emotions because it will come out whether you give space for it or not. It will come out. It'll come out when you shout at somebody. It'll come out when you cry at work or in the supermarket. It will come out. So it is better for you to go, what's going on for me? And everybody's individual in what, in the way that that manifests for them. So for me, I know that if I'm too full of anxiety, if I'm too overwhelmed, which which can happen a lot for me, I will not eat. I will not drink any water. I will feel like my head is spinning. I will just, I kind of zone out. And I do think that's an ADHD thing as well, where I would just zone out for a bit and I'm not focused. I don't know what I'm doing. Everything feels a priority. Everything's too much. And I now notice those signs, but that's because I've, I've got to know myself and I don't judge that now. I would have in the past. I absolutely would would have filled my life full of the shoulds. You should be doing this and other people get it better that you get it right. And you're so disorganized and you're so messy. And why can't you just do it in a normal way? Why, you know, I'd have had all that chitter chatter that we do in our heads. But at 36 now, I just think I am all of those things and that's okay. And if I notice that red flag of it being more heightened, then I have strategies in place to to offload. Sometimes it's a case of going, I just have to stop for a minute because everything that I produce right now will be crap and everything I do will be not, you know, sometimes you've got to, to, it's just not going to be good enough. It's not going to be what I want to be doing. I have people around me that support that. I work with coaches as well that will spot that. And I can, I'm just at a stage now in my life where even with my children, you know, we talk very openly about feelings and things like that. And give space to not even as a parent we feel like sometimes we've got to just keep going and we've got to be that person that doesn't cry in front of our children we've got to be there and that's we should be showing our children that that's okay as well because they watch us and I will often say to the girls and they will definitely agree you know if I if I've not got it right if I've been the shouty mom or I've been a if I've been moany or I've just you know I've not got it right we do all of these things I in the past would have carried so much guilt and shame around that whereas I just articulate to the children I'm feeling like this this is why this has happened I shouldn't have said that and this is how we're going to deal with it in future what can we do and I find solutions and you know we we talk a lot about our feelings in that I will say to the girls if I know I'm not feeling great I will give them the heads up and I will say, girls, I'm not feeling very good today. And this, there might be a reason. Sometimes there is, sometimes there isn't. Most recently we were going, went to John Lewis and one of my clients had a book launch and we went to John Lewis and I realized en route that I hadn't been there for a long time. And the last time I was there was with my husband and we used to, we used to get, John Lewis used to do a free tea and cake if you were a member every month and we used to just go because we both work for ourselves we just used to pot around drinking cups of tea and we used to go to John Lewis and just have cake and tea like when when we had it every month and on the way to John Lewis I became aware that I 
probably would be triggered by that when we got there. So I just let them know and said, I don't, I'm, I might, I don't need you to do anything, but I'm just letting you know that I might feel this way about this. I might be fine, but just so you know, and that's, you know, that as we, we have to give ourselves space for that and, and let go of the shame around it. You don't have to be a perfect person. I am a chaotic human being. I'm inconsistent. I'm chaotic. I'm fiery, but I'm also passionate and care and all of the good stuff. And they don't have to be mutually exclusive. You can be, you can be all of the stuff. And I think the more that you as you can give yourself space to feel, give yourself space to cry, whatever, what way that has to come out, give yourself space to be annoyed. You're allowed to be pissed off at stuff. You know, somebody says something on your YouTube and you can't, can't be the, the stepping back type person. You just want to vent, phone your friend, but, you know, do, get it out, write it down, scrumple it up, do go for a run, whatever you need, but, but know your coping strategies, know what it is that you need. Because even as a coach, I can talk through with you some ideas and some things that have worked for me or clients or some, you know, general generic ideas but you know you better than anybody else you know what's going to work for you you know what's worked before and I think as a coach my job is to remind you of that sometimes yeah and it's difficult isn't it because if you don't do those things then I don't know if you feel the same but as a mum sometimes it can even be something as simple as like you'll drop something on the floor and then you'll just burst into tears and it'll be like well what the hell but it's because you haven't dealt with the other things leading up to it because something's so tiny becomes so massive because you've not allowed yourself that space and time at the particular time that you've been bothered to absolutely 100%. and then we look mental don't we we look crazy like we're crying because we dropped a plate on the floor or yeah. <laughs> spilt and some tea always, on the side it's always the one isn't it where you like really cross and on the edge when and I don't know why the universe makes this happen but your top will hook onto one of That's, the handles I know <laughs> What, I mean, what in the unholy hell? What the, what? Why does that happen? Um, yeah. And then you will lose, you will just lose your mind. And and we all do it. And, you know, like even just us talking now, we haven't even spoken about this beforehand. This is not, in, and yet we both have the same experiences of that in whatever way that is. And that's why I talk about the stuff that I talk about. That's why I talk about my own stuff and share my own stuff because. I know from experience now, having, you know, been on a platform since being a kid, I, it's a strange position to be in that I've ever not been on some sort of platform of either TV or social media or, you know, TV, magazines, whatever. There's always been eyes on. And I guess that's a very unusual experience to have lived through that. I don't, you know, that's not, I have to remind myself that that's not everybody's experience. And and because of that, I've always been very self-aware and that's not always been a good thing because sometimes that's mean that my head spins like for everybody else's opinions of who I'm supposed to be. But I feel like at this stage of my life now, I recognize that the more that I talk about this stuff, the more it opens it up to other people going, that's me as well. Like I'm the, the more same. it resonates and then you just seem like instead of somebody who's because if, if anybody thinks about somebody who's been on TV, they think, oh, because we've not shared the same experience like that, we have no idea what it's like to be in the public eye for whatever reason. And then you often think to yourself that that person is just out of your reach and, and they don't get it. But the way that you're that you're doing your coaching and the way the advice that you're giving to people, it shows that we are exactly the same. And I think that's that's the fundamental key to the success of your of your work definitely I hope so I hope so I mean that's what I try to do and I think that whole um in the self-development industry there's a lot of gurus and there's a lot of people that want to stand on stage and be clapped and strangely enough coming from an actor who obviously has done lots of stuff on stage the the clapping just makes me feel uncomfortable like I don't, <laughs> yeah I've had it to would anybody before. though wouldn't it standing there people clapping you know, like, over that. Mm. but you know I think that comes down to maybe this has grown up in the industry as well and being around lots of successful and famous people and I still work with people that are in the public eye now and you know it's a very small industry so I know a lot of people that are successful now in in sort of the entertainment industry and stuff and what I know from my own lived experience is that exactly what we've just said that 
people are just the same like and so I don't put people on that pedestal I never have I don't remember it would take a lot for me to be like to treat somebody differently because they were famous in some way because I just know and I remember my friend used to say they've still got to take their makeup off at the end of the night and that was that was her like thought of it like you know I think sometimes people say like they still got to go to the toilet but she was like it was just like a really normal thing she was like even the you know Lady Gaga she has to take her makeup off at the end of the day with stuff whatever like it takes ages exactly. you know, the more been on stage yeah, like this but this, I think it's just normalizing that like we can I mean I, I like the niceness of having people that we look up to that's wonderful yeah. but I never want it to and that, that aspirational thing's great and I you know I, I appreciate when people send me things to, to let me know that I've been able, to, been able to give them that as well and I get that and I don't un, I try not to underplay that I've always found that very difficult in fact when my husband was here I remember the first time when we first got together, I'd been on a TV show called Waterloo Road. Um, and it, it was obviously, I don't know if it was on at the time or I don't know, whatever. I'd been on TV on something and we were down in London and some girls, some young girls were like giggling and trying to get my attention. Um, and I was really, I was really uncomfortable with it because I wasn't on TV at the time. Like I wasn't currently in a TV show. So I was massive imposter syndrome, just like, I'm nobody, don't talk to me and really didn't deal with it. And he was like, why are you not like, that's so good. That's so nice. Like, and I was really, and for years, I was really uncomfortable with it. Again, age helps you, you know, be more comfortable with stuff. And now I can look at stuff and go, well, that's nice that people feel that. And I, I can, I can put it in a different space in my head alongside also knowing, I think it was Gary V. I heard talk about this ages ago where he said, don't listen to the, don't listen to the booing and don't listen to the applause too much. Don't listen to either too much. You listen that to the will keep you on a level ground yeah. in no, no matter exactly. what situation. Exactly. And so I try to do that as much as possible. I massively appreciate and I get some lovely messages off people. And that drives me in terms of like when people tell me they've done something amazing with their life because they read an email or they did a course or they work with me. That's brilliant. And I love that. And I'm so lucky that I've been given these skills to be able to do that. But on the flip side, I also want people to know you what I'm not that special I'm not that special you know we're all that special you know like we're we're all that special in in my head like no one person doesn't have flaws and and imperfections of whatever we're all perfectly imperfect and and that's great that's okay and so what I really love about what I'm able to do with my work is to perhaps take people that don't necessarily see that in themselves and maybe look to other people and think they're so special and they're on this stage or they do this thing and get them to see no that's within you because that person just took some steps they're they're not they had it you know they took some steps they took some action they had a dollop of luck and circumstance you know where they were born was a bit of luck and who they grew up with and all of that stuff and health is pot luck but you know everything else like that you can do that as well you might not know the route yet, but you can. And that's, you know, that, that's, that's what you what want it. to do, for sure. Exactly. Have you ever sat back and thought to yourself, like, how, um, because, like you said, you're a very, like, dewy kind of, dewy, if dewy is a word. Like, you're very, like, let's get this done, let's do this, let's do this. Have you ever sat back and thought to yourself, oh, my God, I've literally helped so many people. This is the most amazing feeling in the world. Or, or do you not do that to such a to such a deep level? Do you just keep carrying on? Um, I think the car- I'm I'm a dewy person, so I dewy. Think- <laughs> yes, new word. <laughs> so dewy. Um, <laughs> that's not always a good thing, but I'm leaning into that, just being who I am, and mm. so I don't find it very easy to slow down at all. I don't find it. I, I my relaxed is not other people's relaxed it's not relaxed like on a Pinterest board. Like I would like it, it, I think in the past, I've really desperately tried to do the whole, this is what relaxed looks like. And my mind's like, I'm not relaxed, let's do some stuff. And I think now I'm starting to go on it. It's okay that you're relaxed isn't what that looks like. Um, But I do try along the way. There are moments where I'll do something that will excite me or I'll get that message of somebody that's changed their life or 
I'll hit a milestone that was important to me, whether it was important to the people, it doesn't matter. And I'll, I do really try to what we would class it, what I would class as savor the moment and just take a moment to just let it in a bit because in my, my nature is very dewy and I do go f- like forward quite quickly, which can help when things are difficult, but it doesn't always leave space to appreciate and thankfully I've got good people around me that one of my friends recently said to me um you know you've you've created this life for yourself where you wake up and you do what you want and you you know you create your own work Mm -hmm. you do what you love every day and you have to then not start you allow your work to run you like you just you choose and sometimes I need that reminder because I'm always onto the next thing or the next thought and without sometimes going, you know, if I look at, sometimes it's when I'm doing my taxes and stuff and I actually look at what I've done and I don't necessarily mean monetary always, um, obviously that comes into it, but I mean, like I then have to go through looking at who's done my online courses, how many people have attended things because I'm not, I'm so bad at numbers. It's not my thing at all. And I can't, quant- I find it really difficult to quantify things. It just blows my mind. And so I was going, I was looking through and I still haven't got all the numbers because it was, it's, yeah, it was too much counting and adding up, right? But I'm going to give you an estimate that I kind of worked out. But the the Happy Me Project, my first, you know, flagship self-study course that is still available, it's 30 quid. It's, you know, it was done straight after the death of my husband as a way to give people something because they were asking me how I was navigating all of the, the pain and the grief and I couldn't people at that time. I couldn't talk to people. I couldn't do actual coaching. So I just created. And I am a person that I said it many times before, but in times of difficulty, I create, not I don't consume. That's really important for me. That's how I push through things. And um, when I was going through recently, just how many people have done that course? And I, I didn't really launch that course in any like way, any structured way. I never, I don't think I ever do. I've been on so many courses to teach me how to launch and I get bored. <laughs> I get just like bored. stick it on see how it goes oh, I'm, I'm a bloody nightmare for like you know neurotypical um business cultures because I'm just like that sounds boring I'm like I don't want to do that um I'll just do it my own way and that doesn't always work out for me so maybe I should listen but with this cause I didn't it was just birthed out it was like I'm just gonna put it out in the world and if people need it it's there for them and I was looking recently and there's like there's thousands of people that have done that course and that blows my mind and especially because I'm not hands-on with that course that is a self-study course a self-study program and so I don't necessarily unless people come to me and tell me what they've been doing which people do which I love but it's not like I've got a group coaching program where I'm really hands-on with people and we work together through things or when I'm at a workshop or an event I'm really hands-on and I know what's going on for people with that people just crack on with it and so I was going through all of the names and I was, and it did just take a moment to go, each one of those people are individual people with a reason why they bought that course. They were going through something that made them buy that course at that time. And that blows my mind. And that's, that's really special. And I do try to, um, sorry, my daughter's nose is still bleeding. Are you okay? Will you put, right, go and get the tissue and you need to pinch your nose. You need to do that now. All right, she's an actor at heart. And so she's doing it to try and be dramatic. Pinch your nose. <laughs> this is like a film. I think, have you filmed yourself? No. I bet you have. No, I haven't. I haven't. You definitely have. I haven't. You know. I promise. Right, go and get a tissue, pinch your nose, and hang on. You're supposed to do that, I think. Down, not no. up. Nan said put it up. Yeah, down. You're not. It's down. I think it's down. But I think people think it's up and it's not. I'm meant to put t- a cold teaspoon on the back of your neck. And- a cold teaspoon on the back of your neck. Screen, that's what Nan said. Nan's talking old wives' tales at you, I think. Um, go and get tissue, though, darling. Just pinch your nose. And then she said, pinch there. Okay. Well, and put a cold teaspoon. Like yeah, here, think... it's like right at the top, isn't it? There. Yeah. So do that, because what I've seen you doing is looking in the mirror. I haven't done that. <laughs> go and do that, darling. Go and get a tissue. Just wipe it up. You're all right. I have. You need to keep it bleeding. Yeah, so you need to keep... And I sneeze it. It's all gone all down me. Okay, sweetheart. Right. You need to do that, though. You need to get a tissue. You won't do it. Have tissues. Do you don't have a tissue. Okay, we'll keep it on until it stops bleeding. Okay. Oh God, she's all right. She's fine. She's smiling and looking at herself in the mirror. So I think she's all right. 
<laughs> um, yeah, so I was going to ask you, um, like with my brand in particular, it's, it comes from a deep rooted passion for self care. Um, and basically the story behind the brand is that it came from a tragic time, um, a difficult time that we as a family suffered. Um, like my husband had an accident and suffered a brain injury. Um, and then we, I had major surgery and then we ended up having to visit food banks because financially, I mean, it hit us incredibly hard. Um, and then at that point in one of the food parcels, I found a small body lotion um, and I remember using it and the way that I felt was just incredible. My skin felt amazing and it sounds daft, but I felt like a human again. And at that point, all those years ago, I thought to myself, right, I want to bring that feeling to everyone. I want everyone to feel amazing all the time, no matter what their situation. Um, so because that's deep rooted within me and the brand, what is it that you do for you in regards to self-care, if, especially if you struggle to switch your brain off and, and calm down? That's a, yeah, and that's a lovely, lovely, beautiful story that you've just said there. And it really, I really get that. And I think some of the most beautiful things in the world come from other people's pain and tragedy that we we use that. And when you do, and anybody can do that as well. Um, So in terms of my own self-care, I need to find ways to zone out a little bit because yeah. my natural thing is to keep going so I do things like I draw I sketch okay um, see so creativity I, again I just love create I, I'm a very creative person that's how I get my like I would find it I find it very difficult just to say watch a program without yeah. doing something else that's not something that comes easy so what I often do is I'll find something on Pinterest or like a sketch and I'll just pen paper and I will just sit and sketch and that can yeah. really pull me out and I'm, I'm pretty good at doing art and stuff like I, you know I enjoy it and I've, I find creative stuff like that is my kind of zone out I like to write poetry as well I'm quite I enjoy doing that and me and the girls do a lot of creative stuff here we do a lot of cutting and sticking love doing a dream board with the girls or like we just like making just creative stuff so things like that are very good for my mindset I also bought myself a hot tub um yeah, when yeah, I'm yeah. Yeah. oh you'll and be needing I'm, that this weekend <laughs> um I, too hot I think for the hot tub yeah. weirdly it's too hot but you know I, I in the past I wouldn't ever have done that so it was an absolute frivolous purchase in terms of it was just purely self-care because I wanted it because my working class childhood wanted something fancy like a hot tub oh like you know it's like such a and these days I think it's a working class tell anyway I think a big trampoline and a hot tub <laughs> yeah. but when we were growing up it's like only the rich kids had like hot like yeah. the, the hot tub I mean who are you Richie Rich like we just okay. yeah. such a classic film try, I mean I don't know what what our parents sort of thing it was probably like a jag like a car or something but when um when I moved into the house that I'm in um and uh, my husband didn't live in this house with us so me and my husband bought this house we I have property as well and so um we had bought this we kept our house and we were do, doing this one up and to move into and um when I was doing it and I was thinking about how I went into every room and I sat in the room and I thought, how would I like to feel in this room and how is this going to look? And I really sat in the rooms and were like, this is how this is going to be. And it's going to feel like this. And in the garden, I mean, the garden was an absolute like mess. And I thought to myself, I'm going to get a hot tub in here. And bear in mind, I really have to stretch my imagination to that stuff because sometimes I go to that set point of, but you don't need that stuff. You don't need that stuff. You could live without that stuff. I go, you know, you don't want to give yourself anything. And although I'm certainly not materialistic, I do think, and this again, something I've had to learn, like you're allowed to have nice things too. And that's okay. It doesn't mean make you a bad, like self-development person because you don't want to live in the woods and you want to get your nails done and some Botox. Like it doesn't, that doesn't, nothing's going to happen. Like you, you can be both, you know. Today it's about what makes you happy. Exactly. And so when that to me just felt like pure luxury to have a hot tub in the garden and like have all of a nice garden, nice kitchen. And, um, I put all the electrics in, not knowing when I could afford to buy this bloody jacuzzi hot tub and 
all of this stuff when I would do it. And so when all the work was done in the house, I put all the electricity in. It's got all the, you know, the, is it the trip switch, whatever they're called. I'm not an electrician, clearly. And um, put all the stuff in. And I, could, I ended up being able to get it sooner than I thought. And when the guy came to put it in, he actually said to me, had you not thought ahead of time that you would want to do this because I built I extended on my house as well if you hadn't thought ahead of time you wouldn't have got this hot tub because it would have been such a job to get the electrics now through the to do what we need to you just you wouldn't have been bothered and so I was like because everyone laughed at me as well I was like oh do you think you are bloody hot tub and all of that I mean they're not laughing now when they come in the hot tub and they're all like so so you're actually meaning one of them big posh ones not like ones you can buy from B&M Oh, one of the big posh ones. Oh my God. With the wood around it. It's got Bluetooth. It's built into the floor. Oh, it has never. Bubbles. It got, it's got lights. So if you do it late at night, it's got lights. Oh, it's lovely. I love it. And that, I mean, I haven't had much time in it recently at night time because we, um, my daughters weren't working up a lot. Um, but it is lovely to be able to have that. And so for me, water's a, a luxury. Having a bath or having a, going in the hot tub, that's a very calming thing for me because it's a very tactile thing. But I tend to, in terms of relaxation, beautying, beautifying myself, I find relaxing. So when you said about the moisturizers and body lotions, that to me is like, I like to paint my nails. I mean, they're dis- disgraceful right now, but they do a job. If you do that really quickly, you can't see them. I like to... I like to beautify. So I like to spend time doing things for myself. And that's always actually been something I've done. So when I'm getting ready in the morning, I take a lot of time to get ready. It takes me seven minutes to get my hair and makeup done. If I actually do it with purpose, I've timed it. And, but I tend to take ages because I like the process. It's like drawing, you know, you literally draw, I'm drawing on features. And um, so I, I like that, I faff. So when I'm watching something in bed, I'm putting creams on and I'm doing stuff and I'm faffing and I'm doing my hair. I like that feels like that feels like self-care to me. That feels like that kind of that time for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Do you have time for a quiz or do you need to sort nosebleeds out? How long is the quiz? And then I'll judge it. Well, I've got a few questions, but I also have three audio clues. We could just do the audios if you'd like. I'm actually, I feel like I've excelled myself here. I've actually got audio clues. Are you all right? You look better now. I nearly cleared it. You've cleared it. Do you want to get your gun different top? Yeah. Go on then. Is Texas ready for bed and I should brush your teeth? Go and brush your teeth, guys. Yeah. I think we'll be all right. Brooke, turn it down, please. We're being recorded. Um, let's go for the audios. Okay, Talk let's about. do it. Right then. Right I'm on. excited. Oh my God. I just hope it works. Okay, I need you to tell me what this sound is from. Okay, hold on. Pressure. It might be too loud. Bear with. Uh, it's a game Did you shot. used to have a uh, Sega Mega Drive when you were younger? No. Oh, no. damn it. Okay, um, moving on. <laughs> No, I did have a Nintendo 64 at one point. Um, that was, my dad bought it off some bloke down the pub. Right then. Okay. Let's go for the, next- the question here, I really hope you used to watch this. What? Use your body. Yeah, fun. Is it Fun House? Yeah. Yay! And for an extra Brucey bonus, what was the name of the presenter? It was Pat Sharp. Was Pat Sharp? Yes. 
you Weirdly, are a legend. Yesterday, Pad Sharp was on. I was looking for some a present for somebody, and you can pay for Pad Sharp to do a birthday message for someone on a some website. Oh, I've seen those. Like it's like a website into it when you can do personal messages. That's really cool. Yeah, I love that show Fun House. I wanted to be on it. It was good. Oh, God, it me too. Let's do it. And I think we should do it as adults. We should. What else it. I really want to be on? I had these like written questions. I really wanted to be on Crystal Maze. <gasps> yes, but I always felt like that. You see, because Crystal Maze, there was there was actually hard things to do on Crystal Maze. Like <laughs> some of them were quite. I felt from my they were quite mathematical. Some of them. Yeah. I wouldn't be very good on Crystal Maze, but that last bit when all the was it like the all tickets. the stuff, oh, just how much did we want to do that? That was brilliant. Um, yeah. Right, we have one last one. I hope you watch this as well. If you watch Fun House, I'm pretty sure you're going to have watched this, but we'll see. Right, we you're going to hear what it's called, but I want you to tell me what they're going to say at the end. What does he love? Mashed potato. Yay! <laughs> and I have I have a really, really weird story about the guy that's in that, but I can't tell you on this, but I will tell you at some point really oh, weird story. Send me a DM. <laughs> really weird story I can't unthink I can't unhear it so I'm gonna to have to share it with you impulsively but we're not gonna share the podcast because we're we get in trouble but um very funny humorous story about the guy that was in it but it was mashed potato what a weird show that was actually I when know. we think back on it he used to whack him with the spoon didn't he with all mashed potato all over it <laughs> honestly you know going through getting some questions about the 90s oh it was just wonderful well, everybody did quizzes, didn't they, during lockdown? I did one because um, I was forced. Everyone said I was being really unsociable. Um, and I was like, I didn't do quizzes before lockdown. I'm not doing quizzes now. I didn't. Um, but I did one of them and it was all a 90s one. Um, none of those questions, though. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I, I probably do all right with 90s stuff. I think I might be stuck in that era a little bit. <laughs> That's what happens yeah. when you get old. But our kids tell us we're old, though, don't they? That's the sad thing. Yeah. We are very old to our children yeah this is it I didn't even know I don't I mean what they don't tell you I mean our parents probably did tell us but what will fail to recognize is that you don't feel it in your head and you still feel like you know you feel 18. like somebody, yeah, somebody else yeah. should, should charge like I've got kids <laughs> Humans, bring it up. Humans, actual humans. I have responsibilities, and yeah. it's just. I mean, it's it hard sometimes, doesn't it? Like a punch in the gut, and you're like, "Am I sure I'm the right person for the job?" I don't. I don't think we ever know. So, anyone that's listening is feeling like you know we've got it sorted in some way. I mean, after yeah. this podcast, you probably won't. But um, <laughs> if you ever are on any illusions that people on the internet that you see and stuff have any you know they know what they're doing we don't we definitely do not (laughs) and finally holly um the yes she can project is all about um empowering other women making them feel less alone um what is the most empowering thing that you have ever been told or piece of advice that you've ever been given or given to somebody else oh that's That's a a hard one (laughs) hard one um (laughs) What is the best piece of advice? Do you know what? One I like to, again, I like to go back to simple. But the thing that I think about a lot, and I don't know for who told me or if I just read it, but the thing I think about a lot in my life as I go through it is if you keep doing what you've always done, you'll keep getting what you always got. And so when things don't feel right, I have to do something different. It's got to be switched up in some way whatever that is all of the stuff we've touched upon whether that's I need to slow down I need to speed up I need to cry I need to take a break I need to get creative but if I keep doing what I've always done I keep getting what I've always got and so wherever your listeners are in the world or in their lives right now 
it's worth noting that that if you feel like you're banging your head against the wall it's because things are happening in the same way and sometimes that's stuff that you aren't necessarily aware of so sometimes that's deeper stuff like limiting beliefs that you've got going on under the surface and in which case you need to come and see somebody like me and you need to work out whoa what's going on under there because there's a reason why you keep revisiting the same stuff time and time again there's a reason why that stuff keeps showing up in your life there's a reason why you can't get past this point something has to change and so that's my one of my favorite quotes and again because it's simple if you keep doing what you've always done you'll keep getting what you've always got what a lovely way to end this episode it's wonderful it's been so nice to have you holly i could talk to you all day um yeah it's just been wonderful and I'm so so grateful that you came on and everybody go over onto Instagram Facebook YouTube Twitter everywhere and go and follow Holly you definitely won't regret it she's absolutely wonderful thank you thank Thank you so much and we shall speak soon we shall and I will tell you that story as well (laughs) bit of juicy goss (laughs) I'm going to go and deal with my children now and find out who's bleeding for what orifice out there. (laughs) It's all going on, isn't it?